Hi, welcome to TSI's open course on conservation and genomics for threatened species management. My name is Lauren White. I'm a molecular ecologist at the Arthur Riley Institute for Environmental Research, and I'll be taking you through module 4.4, non-invasively collected samples. My aim is to give you a broad overview of the use of non-invasively collected samples in conservation genomics projects. This module is fairly specific to studies of wildlife, since a non-invasive sample collection isn't particularly applicable to plant or captive animal studies. I'll talk about what I mean by non-invasively collected samples, how they differ from ideal genetic sample types, uh, why they're so challenging to work with in the lab, and the extra considerations that need to be taken into account during collection. Uh, finally, I'll discuss the types of genomic data generation that can and can't be applied to these sample types. So ideally, when undertaking a conservation genomic study of wildlife, researchers will collect high quality DNA, such as tissue or blood. These types of samples typically provide a large amount of pure DNA from the study species, which is organized into long DNA molecules. And this makes them applicable to the full range of molecular methods of data, uh, genomic data generation. However, collecting these types of samples requires wildlife to be trapped and handled. This can be expensive and time consuming, and for some species just may be logistically infeasible. So in situations in which wildlife trapping and handling are off the table, researchers may turn to sample types that can be collected non-invasively. These are genetic samples that can be collected without direct contact with wildlife, and so they may minimize the impact on the environment and the study species, and they can be less time consuming and more efficient to collect in the field than traditional uh, tissue or blood sampling. Some examples of these sample types are hair or feathers, or um, probably the most common non-invasive sample type of species or scats. These samples contain DNA from the individual that deposited them, which can be extracted and analyzed. Um, they're attributable, that's to say they are attributable to one individual. If you find a feather, you know that came from a single bird. And this distinguishes them from uh, environmental DNA or eDNA, which is DNA extracted from the broader environment, such as soil or water samples. Uh, it's, it's more difficult to attribute eDNA to a single individual of a species. And there, there are other modules in the open course that cover eDNA for those who are interested. While non-invasive sampling may reduce the costs of field work, these sample types can be very challenging to work with in the lab. Some typical characteristics of DNA extracted from non-invasively collected samples are low quant quantity of DNA from the target organism. Not only is there often inherently less DNA in these sample types compared to tissue or blood, but non-invasive samples have usually been exposed to the environment for some amount of time before collection during which time the DNA within them is going to be degrading, leaving even less available for analysis. Additionally, as DNA degrades, chromosomes are gonna fragment into smaller and smaller molecules, which is why DNA found within non-invasive sample types is typically found in much shorter fragments than in high quality DNA. <coughs> Scat samples in particular are prone to contain inhibitors. These are molecules or chemicals that can be co-purified with DNA during extraction and they can interfere with molecular techniques and sequencing if they're not effectively removed. Finally, non-invasive samples can contain a high proportion of DNA from non-target organisms. This is especially true from scats, which is going to contain a large amount of DNA from the diet of the depositing organism, as well as a lot of DNA from microbiota. These characteristics mean that when working with non-invasively collected samples, uh, some molecular methods may be unusable. Researchers may need to employ specialized or tailored lab methods to, to work with the small and degraded DNA within them, which in turn may lower the, the number of samples that could be processed at the same time. We generally expect higher dropout rates and higher error rates when using these types of samples, which may mean that sequencing effort needs to be higher to reach an acceptable level of data quality all of which increases the lab time and costs compared to high quality DNA samples. To mitigate against these challenges, special care should be taken during the collection of non-invasively collected samples to prevent the further loss in DNA uh, and degradation of DNA. So for example, 
all effort should be made to collect samples that are as fresh as possible to minimize the amount of time that they spend exposed to the environment, uh, during which time the DNA is going to be degrading. Special consideration should also be taken about how to collect these samples and thinking about where the DNA is, is, is found within the samples. For example, in hair samples, most of the DNA is going to be found in the follicle. There's very little in the shaft. Similarly, with feathers, most DNA is found in the tip. Finally, the general advice for collecting DNA from scat samples is to target the outside of the scats, uh, where epithelial cells from the intestinal tract are expected to be concentrated. However, my experience with scat samples is that they are highly variable across environments, across species between individuals. Uh, and so pilot studies that uh, look to optimize collection methods are usually a good uh, first step. Like other DNA sample types, non-invasively collected samples should be stored somewhere cold whilst, while minimizing freeze thaw sub, uh, cycles. They should be stored somewhere dark, away from UV light, and in a buffer that minimizes enzyme or microbial activity. Although feathers and hair can sometimes be stored dry for a short amount of time. All these steps ensure that DNA degradation is minimized. So when planning a conservation genomics project that's going to use non-invasively collected samples, it's very important to realize that some methods of generating data are going to be infeasible or impossible. Um, I'm just going to mention two of the most uh, popular, but there are others. So for example, restriction enzyme-based techniques such as DART-seq or DD-RAD-seq. These are very popular methods in conservation genomics today. They involve using a particular type of enzyme to fragment DNA molecules and attach adapters which allow the same subsection of the genome to be sequenced across individuals. They require a re reasonable amount of DNA, but that fragmentation step by the enzyme also requires DNA to be in long molecules, which is why they are difficult or impossible to apply to non-invasively collected sample types. Similarly, genome and organelle assem de novo assembly is not possible using non-invasive samples. This is the process of reconstructing the complete chromosome length sequences of an organism's genome. It involves using computational methods to piece together the shorter fragments that come off the DNA sequences. Um, these methods usually need a large amount of DNA and to resolve the complicated areas of the genome, for example, the repetitive sections, you need fragments that you need to read through fragments that cross those sections. So you need long DNA fragments. So again, these aren't available in non-invasively collected samples. <laughs> yeah. All right, but as long as the extracted DNA from the non-invasively collected samples isn't too degraded, uh, molecular methods can be applied. Uh, usually these are those that use PCR or hybridization capture to amplify or enrich the genomic regional markers of interest before sequencing. Uh, and the choice between these two types of methods usually depends on the number of markers that are desired. So when the research question can be answered using tens to hundreds of markers, uh, methods that use PCR to target a pre-designed panel of markers are usually the most appropriate for non-invasive samples. So these methods rely on PCR to amplify the regions of the genome surrounding the chosen markers. Here I've got one double-stranded DNA copy that contains the marker that we're interested in, in red. And during PCR, sequences of DNA that are complementary to the regions flanking the marker, so these are called primers, the primers will bind to the DNA at the complementary sites, and an enzyme called polymerase will then extend the primer sequence by copying the template strand. So we end up with two copies from one. By repeating this process many, many times using primers that target many different markers, we can end up with many copies of the markers we're interested in. So even if we have a very small amount of DNA to begin with, we can amplify the markers we're interested in to make them um, easily sequenceable. So after amplification, we can prepare uh, the DNA for sequencing on, say, a standard high throughput platform like Illumina, or researchers may choose to use other platforms that combine PCR and the sequencing step. Uh, for example, microfluidics from Biomark or mass spec based platforms such as mass array. If larger marker panels or genomic regions need to be sequenced from non-invasive samples, hybridization capture methods usually need to be applied. 
So hide captured aims to increase the proportion of target DNA in an extract before sequencing. They use modified DNA or RNA baits that are complementary to the target region, which will bind to the target DNA in an extract and then can be immobilized in a variety of ways. Here we're using magnets, allowing the non-target DNA to be washed away. After capture, the captured DNA can be prepped and sequenced on the standard high throughput sequences. Uh, these methods are highly flexible. They can target any genomic region of any size, but they can be very expensive. Synthesizing the baits is costly and sequencing requirements, especially for degraded samples is substantial. Uh, I also wanna point out that both these method, methods, PCR targeting or hybridization capture, they require previously generated genomic resources to be available to, be, to, to work. So you need to know the sequences surrounding the markers or the sequences of the, of the genomic region you're uh, targeting to either design primers or to, to design baits. Okay, that's all for me from module 4.4. Just to summarize the main points that I'd like you to take away from this module. Non-invasively collected samples are those that can be collected without direct contact with wildlife and thus may make field work more efficient. However, they have many characteristics that make lab work challenging and collection methods should be optimized to prevent further DNA degradation. It's important to realize that some genomic methods of data generation cannot be used with these sample types, but as long as the DNA isn't too degraded, PCR or hybridization based techniques may be able to be used. Even so, lab work involving non-invasively collected samples is usually more expensive and time consuming than working with high quality DNA, all of which should be taken to, into account when planning a conservation economics project. I hope you found this module useful. Uh, for more details on other aspects of conservation genomics and a number of end-to-end -end case studies, check out the other modules in the open course. And thank you to all the parties who have contributed to and continue to contribute to DSI.